Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webcast, How to Balance NERC SIP v6 versus NERC SIP v5 Compliance. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming cor correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget on the bottom of your screen. It's the question mark icon, and it covers most common technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast, as well as the slides. Now let's get on with the presentation. Our two speakers today are Nick Santora, CEO of Curricula, and Tim Erlin, Senior Director, Product Management at Tripwire. They're both going to tell a little bit about themselves. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to Nick and Tim. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. My name is Nick Santor, CEO of Curricula. A uh, quick background on myself, I spent about seven years over at NERC as a, a NERC staffer and worked with anything and everything in the word SIP, so helped advise the audit approach for SIP auditors, a compliance approach. I worked on the implementation study with six entities to early adopt version five. Had a pretty vast experience in small and large style entities, um, working with them transitioning from version three to version five and recently left NERC to help found Curricula, which is an organization focused on cybersecurity training and education, uh, specifically working with the utility industries on NERC SIP. And I'll pass it over to Tim. And I'm Tim Erlin, uh, Director of Product Management at Tripwire. And I've been working with uh, NERC SIP for quite a long time uh, and Tripwire products. And I officially took over the Tripwire NERC uh, solution suite from a product management standpoint uh, a couple of years back. Uh, and I'm pretty excited to be here, and I'm happy that you guys are, are willing to spend a little bit of time with us. I'll start by giving you a, a little bit of the agenda that we're going to talk through here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, uh, that I'm going to do actually in this case, is walk through the uh, SIP v6 changes and a little bit about the compliance dates, the effective compliance dates uh, that apply to those. Then I'm going to hand it over to Nick to talk about how SIP v6 affects your personnel. Then we're going to get to the three critical steps to take before the July deadline. Uh, and finally, we'll finish up with a little bit of Q&A and give you guys uh, on the phone uh, a chance to ask questions. So uh, I always find reading the NERC SIP documents uh, a, a, an interesting challenge. Um, between the, the FERC orders and the standards themselves, uh, it can be difficult to interpret what's, uh, what's really going on and what's really being said. So taking a look at what came out uh, and was approved with SIP v6, there are a number of changes that um, you know, are specifically addressed within the, the SIP standards uh, with this revision. And I'm going to walk through them a little bit, talk about them, and then we'll talk about those, those compliance dates. So first of all, um, we're looking at SIP 3-6. Uh, in this case, the uh, primary change, well, there are a couple specific changes within the standard. First of all, they moved the, the R2 up into R1, so there's a little consolidation there. And then uh, the new R2 is all about the low-impact BES cyber assets. So that's really the the primary addition, uh, and then R3 remains unchanged in there. Uh, and the addition of, of uh, the low impact assets really gets defined in a couple of attachments. So attachment one uh, defines what you need to do with your uh, low impact assets if you have them. Uh, and that involves a, a plan or a program for cybersecurity awareness, physical security controls, um, electronic access controls, and cybersecurity uh, incident response as well. And then attachment two really um, talks about documentation. Um, so making sure that the plans that you've put in place are adequately documented so that uh, you can provide evidence for audit. Now, interestingly enough, of course, in there, 
there's a specific statement that you don't actually need to do a complete inventory of your low impact cyber assets. Um, this was a point of some discussion in the development of the standard. Uh, so there was concern that uh, the, the variety and volume and uh, distribution of low impact assets would make creating an actual inventory um, overly burdensome on uh, registered entities. So while a program needs to be put in place, uh, the actual inventory is, is excluded from that requirement. Uh, of course, there's one more component here to note. Um, oh, sorry, uh, the, the next set of requirements is really around the transient devices and removable media. Um, this was, of course, also a, a, a topic of much discussion in the development of the standards. Uh, in this case, uh, there's certainly a, a large conditional clause uh, that um, these uh, requirements really only apply if you actually use transient cyber assets uh, and removable media. So one way to avoid the requirement entirely is to simply uh, run your operation in a way that, that doesn't actually use uh, transient cyber assets or removable media. In many cases, that's not possible. And in those cases, uh, you need to put in place a plan for um, a fairly uh, reasonable and logical set of requirements. Um, transient uh, asset management and authorization. So you need to make sure that you actually understand what transient cyber assets you have uh, and what they're authorized to do. Uh, you have to have a plan in place for uh, mitigation of vulnerabilities of malicious code, uh, so malware, uh, and of unauthorized use. Uh, and that applies to the, the transit cyber assets. And then on the removable media side, there's actually a shorter set of requirements, um, given that their removable medias are, media is a, a storage device primarily rather than a, a full computing device. Uh, there is a process required for authorization and also ma uh, malicious code mitigation. And this is actually divided up in the standard into um, two sections, one for uh, your own transient cyber assets and another for uh, service providers as well. And here is where there is another component to consider. So you've got the actual requirements for transient cyber assets and removable media in SIP 10-2, and then SIP 4-6 adds the training component. So it's important to note that you not only need to uh, actually have a plan for these uh, transient cyber assets and removable media, but you also have to update your NERC SIP training to account for these changes in the standard. Um, and that's an important consideration as well. So moving forward to SIP 6-6, uh, this is an interesting one uh, because it's primarily about, uh, the standard is primarily about um, physical security, but the change here uh, gives uh, entities a chance to, uh, when they can't put in place or, um, uh, you know, are, are restricted from putting in place actual physical controls that are required, to substitute uh, a, a compensating logical control and remain compliant. And in this case, the examples they give are um, encryption uh, or monitoring or, quote unquote, an equally effective logical control. So in this case, if you can't physically secure some set of, of, of cabling uh, or um, uh, other assets that are, are physically, should be physically secured, you can encrypt the data going across them. You can monitor logically uh, those assets or that infrastructure, or you can take advantage of this quote unquote equally effective logical control statement. Um, and uh, and I, I won't say roll the dice, but you, if you can convince your auditor that it's an equally effective logical control, you have an opportunity there to um, either shift costs or remain compliant in a way that um, you couldn't before. The interesting statement that uh, is actually in the standard that's, that's notable here, uh, at least I thought was notable, is, is at the bottom here, that, uh, quote, the entity is under no obligation to justify or explain why it chose logical protections over physical protections identified in the requirement. So while the spirit of the requirement is intended to say that if you can't implement physical controls, you can implement compensating logical controls. At the same time, the standard is, is clear that you don't actually have to explain why you couldn't implement the physical controls that are required. You just have to demonstrate that you have the, the required compensating logical controls in place. Uh, so that may become an interesting area of discussion uh, or of implementation for organizations that, that um, have some challenges with the, the physical security controls in place. And then finally, there was a sweeping set of changes uh, around the language of identify, assess, and correct, uh, which folks may be familiar with. So back in FERC Order 791, uh, the, the commission uh, demonstrated their concern about this language and saying that it was overly vague, lacking basic definition and guidance. 
um, essentially saying that that language was tricky, hard to interpret, uh, and, and burdensome on registered entities for, for demonstrating compliance. So across uh, SIP 4, 7, 9, and 12, uh, 11 in this case, uh, the identify, assess, and correct language has been removed, uh, and hopefully this will help um, uh, create a, a greater level of clarity during the audit process about what's actually required uh, to comply with the standards. Um, so that's a, a, a broad but not terribly deep change and um, should hopefully improve the situation for uh, folks during their audits moving forward. So those are uh, that's a, a, a high-level view of the changes in SIP v6 uh, and the v6 standards, and um, hopefully that gives you a sense of where the major changes are, what you need to pay attention to. Uh, the second piece here is really about the compliance dates. So interestingly enough, we're all focused on the July 1st date, uh, but um, when you break down the uh, implementation plan from NERC that was published on January 23rd of this year, you find that there are a number of uh, different dates that apply, of course, uh, to the individual requirements. So I've just broken them down here uh, across SIP 3.6 uh, and 6.6 um, and 7.6 six and, 7, six and uh, 10-2. Uh, you've got a set of dates that are adjusted. So instead of July 1st, 2016, you've got uh, April 1st of 2017, September of 2018 for a couple of them. Uh, and then you've got some date choices as well, uh, depending on specific conditions. So if you break that down based on what they apply to, it looks a bit like this. So for the low impact assets, um, you actually have uh, some additional time uh, to implement those plans based on the, the implementation plan that NERC published. Uh, and those two conditional deadlines, it depends on, on uh, some specific conditions about the, the, whether those assets were uh, previously identified or not, and uh, also where they exist in the environment. Uh, and then the transient removable requirements in 10-2 uh, actually uh, uh, don't apply until um, April 1st of 2017 based on that implementation plan. But um, it's worth noting that the training requirements uh, don't have a separate deadline here. So when we looked at the addition of transient removable, there's a deadline for compliance, but the deadline for training is, uh, hasn't shifted, isn't indicated here in the implementation plan. It's different. So with that covered, I'm going to hand it over to Nick at this point uh, to talk a little bit about how these SIP v6 uh, changes affect your personnel. Nick? Thanks, Tim. Let me flip this over to the next slide here. Here we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how SIP version 6, we call it, is affecting your personnel, um, all the way up to the July 1st date and beyond. And we're going to talk about training program, the awareness program, some of the new additions and modifications within those, and then kind of really the whole risk to this education piece of SIP. So we all know that the date from April 1st moved to July 1st. Um, with that, your training program is formally SIP 004R2. Um, your date is July 1st, 2016. That is not moving anymore. And that applies to all of your high and medium impact bed cyber assets, cyber systems, and the personnel associated to it. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about specifically what that entails. So what's required? So very similar to everything that we saw and knew was coming. Um, you know, everything from cybersecurity policies is where you really want to start. Um, the policies themselves cover everything from incident response plans all the way down to SIP exceptional circumstances. So whenever we talk with an entity, we make sure that this is kind of your founding guideline on how the rest of these are going to fall into place. If you haven't put together your policies yet, you want to start there. Um, the new addition that you'll see is all the way on objective statement number nine called Bez Cyber System Interconnectivity uh, with the addition of removable media and transient cyber assets. So a lot of times we get the question of, well, shouldn't I just train on all of the standards? And is that what I'm supposed to do? Technically, no. You're supposed to train on these nine objective statements. Bez Cyber System Interconnectivity is not a standard. That's a concept of how Bez Cyber Systems and assets talk to each other and talk outside and inside of ESPs. So that is a whole kind of uh, concept that's new to this training objective. And then removal media and transient, we'll go into a second on kind of what you need to cover inside of there. So what is required? Um, on this one, you really want to cover all of your staff, contractors, vendors, and even your cleaning crew, anyone that has either 
unescorted physical access to high and medium bed cyber systems or electronic access to bed cyber systems. So all of these uh, you know, vendors, contractors, staff that I mentioned are all in scope of the program. Um, they must complete that training prior to access to bed cyber assets. So, you know, when we look at the, the timeline that's required to this, we look at, you know, your SIP year, we like to call it. So a SIP year is every 15 months. Um, you'll notice that in the standards, they removed the word annual in a lot of places because it um, could be seen different ways by different entities depending on their program. So whenever you see these kind of annual requirements, they're always going to be referred to as 15 months. And if you learn anything from this webinar, just remember that is called a SIP year in our, our little world. Um, the reason behind that is gives you a year to perform the maintenance on that requirement. Then also in case someone, let's say, is out of the office on vacation or just, uh, you know, wasn't responding to the requirement, um, you have a couple months to kind of play catch up and, and fix that. But highly recommended to stay on the annual life cycle there, but just use those extra three months as a buffer. So what are the auditors going to look for? One of the um, items that we look at, and we have a link here to the, the WEC presentation, is simply regurgitating the requirement language does not constitute a, developing a policy, program, process, or procedure. So what that really means is copy and pasting the standards and showing them to your staff is not a program. And what you need to develop is a SIP compliance training program. So you can read kind of that, that presentation there that we have the link to. A lot of detailed information on the audit approach for these, but that's one of the things that we highly stress is you have to actually train your staff on this, just not regurgitate the requirements to them. So role-based training, this is um, one that comes up quite often is, well, don't I have to do role-based training now? Um, the, the standards actually have it written in there as an option. So you have the capability of doing role-based training and the option to do so. What I would highly recommend and advise is do not overcomplicate this concept. The purpose of the nine objective statements and what NERC has defined on teaching those statements is to cover the basic principles and concepts of NERC 6. And what I've seen so many times in the past is developing such a deep layer of intricate role-based training that you kind of start losing vision of why this standard is here in the first place. And, you know, I've seen everywhere to five, six different access roles um, on different levels, on different objectives, on different statements of, of what staff needs to learn about SIP. And what winds up happening is when someone switches roles or uh, transfers to a different group or, or leaves, it uh, becomes, becomes a lot of overhead for the entity to manage and uh, report on. So what I recommend is teaching those nine objective statements, keep it simple, get to the basics, and then there's always going to be a goal of applying those concepts to specific roles. Just don't push it so far into your training program that you wind up losing vision of why it's there in the first place. So that's kind of a high level of the training program. The awareness program we'll touch on a little bit. So I used to do dozens and dozens of audit oversight all across the country. And typically what I would see is, you know, kind of a silly poster hanging up like this. And, yeah, posters are, are one way to, to have an awareness program, um, you know, to, to put something together for SIP and check the box. But in reality, take SIP away. What is the purpose of cybersecurity awareness? It's to educate and keep your staff kind of aware of cybersecurity concepts and issues out, you know, in their day-to-day -day work. So, you know, honestly, hanging up a poster is not the only approach to awareness. There are plenty of other options. Um, and really what they're looking for, the, the auditor is going to come in, and they're going to look at kind of what you're doing to help build the culture of cybersecurity within your entity. So some of those things could be hanging up a poster, but could be other things like webinars and live presentations and reinforcement and all different types of activities that kind of help build that culture that I talked about. So what needs to happen with that awareness program? For your high and medium assets, uh, impact fed cyber systems, they need to have by July 1st, which is Q3 of 2016, an awareness program set up and running. So that's for your medium and highs. Now, come April 1st of 2017 is when your low impacts come into play. They also need to have a cybersecurity awareness program 
Um, that one is based annually, which is a little bit weird on how that language got written and finalized because awareness is not really an annual activity, but compared to a high and medium, it's a significantly less amount of um, efforts compared to doing a quarterly program. So take your high and mediums, look at them quarterly for high and mediums, annual for low impacts. So what do I do with transient and removable? So Tim kind of mentioned that, you know, all of this is kind of baked into attachment one. Um, in there you have different sections for transient and removables. Section one talks about transient cyber assets managed by the entity. Section two is uh, transients managed by a third party. And then section three of attachment one is the removable media. So Tim kind of mentioned some of those dates flipped around here and there. Um, this date is on April 1st of 2017 is when that becomes effective. So you have a little bit less than a year to get that program procedure all in place, up and running, and become effective on that date. So that's really important because that's going to be a significant amount of work if you are using transient and removables inside your environment. And again, another way out of that is, is writing a policy saying we do not allow transient or removables. But um, if you do, you're going to have to have that ready and effective by that date. So then, again, Tim brought this up is what is, uh, you know, what do we do and why is, why do we have to do training about a year prior to when the effective date is? And yeah, it became a little messy with all these date changes and, and things moving around and approvals not at the most efficient times possible, but it is what it is and, and this is what we have to deal with. So what you need to do on July 1st of 2016 for your training is talk about transient and removable. So talk about the attachments, what's going into them, advise on the kind of high level of what the transient devices, what removal are, and how they affect your SIP program. And of course, that is going to probably change throughout the year while you're actually building out your procedures and implementing this. So our recommendation is, yes, you need to have this ready. It is kind of silly that it's not effective in, in another year from now. You can always update that program later on or add it on top of your formal SIP training program, but you need to have that in by July 1st, 2016, two-year formal SIP training program. So kind of wrap things up, the risk of education. So why are we doing this in the first place? You know, we have a ton of requirements to deal with. Personnel, in our eyes, is one of the highest risks to the organization because it's your people that are operating the grid. It's your people that are operating all of these devices and have access to them. And really what we look at is that Training and education is the foundation of your SIP program. If you didn't have any people who knew what they were doing in SIP, uh, it would, this whole thing would be kind of a mess right now. You know, the machines aren't going to run themselves. So what you need to do is treat it that way. You know, if you have employees, staff, contractors, vendors that have access to these devices, really take the effort to put in quality education to get them up to speed on what SIP is all about, whether they're new or not to the SIP environment. Uh, very important in our eyes. Another thing that we, we show here in risks is um, I'd always see this kind of not at blame game um, when it comes especially to the training requirements. And really what I mean here is, you know, when you, when you wind up working with contractors and staff and vendors and potentially different siloed groups, um, you wind up running into this, this area of, well, you know, that was Nick's job to take care of that contractor and Susie was supposed to take care of that vendor and, and they wound up not sending a notification. And you wind up floating around with these little uh, million-dollar filing cabinets, we call them. And whether those be digital or physical, they're records of compliance that you need to demonstrate to an auditor. And so many times I've seen, you know, the night before about the audit six years before, and it's a scramble saying, well, where are these records? And how do we find them? And put them all together. And it's a, it's a couple late nights for, for the SIP staff at the entity side to try to demonstrate some of this stuff. And... Really what we want you to do is focus on not kind of playing the blame game because at the end of the day, it's the entity that takes the hit for missing a record. And you want to get on the same page, get in the same room, and really figure out where you need to be in your training program to get up to speed. And with that, I'll pass that back over to Tim to cover some of the critical steps. So it's been a, a, a long march, I think, for um, everyone involved towards the uh, April 1st deadline with SIP v5. Uh, you know, we, we spent a, a lot of time preparing, and I know that um, the Tripwire and our customers, it's been uh, uh, a lot of work uh, headed towards that April 1st deadline. 
uh, only to find out that uh, we actually had a little more time uh, with that movement of the, the official deadline uh, to July 1st. Uh, and this results in uh, what we'll call a, a little bit of chunk of uh, a found time. In talking to most of our customers uh, and, um, and and others in the industry, uh, you know that that April first deadline was so so set in stone for so so long uh, that most of the programs were were really targeted towards that anyway. And by the time the date moved, it didn't make sense for uh, organizations to actually change their processes or plans uh, to a July first deadline, but just to stick with that April first. Uh, and if um, if there were things that slipped, then at least it wasn't uh, wasn't impactful. So the question that we really wanted to address uh, was, what should you be doing with this found time uh, remaining between April 1st and July 1st? And, and as we've seen with um, uh, a number of the, the requirements, especially around SIP v6, you've got some additional time there to deal with as well. Uh, so we wanted to put together the three critical steps that um, we felt organizations should take if they find that they've got a chunk of time uh, to do some additional preparation. Uh, and the, the first of those uh, is really uh, to conduct a mock audit. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, you know, most of the time we spend uh, preparing for that audit, um, conducting a mock audit, even a, a, a partial uh, mock audit, uh, gives the organization a chance to really examine how they might respond to uh, an actual audit uh, and identify any areas where you might have a, a weakness in terms of compliance uh, actual compliance, or, or also in terms of evidence. So Nick was was giving the example of um, that million dollar file cabinet and uh, the potential of a, a late night trying to to find evidence of of training in that case. Uh, that's a great example where, in fact, uh, an organization may be compliant with the actual requirement, but surfacing the evidence required might be a challenge. Uh, and a mock audit can really help identify those areas. Um, either where the program is lacking or where the evidence is difficult to produce. Uh, and of course, by identifying that uh, ahead of time, you get your give yourselves a chance to um, take a remedi uh, remediation step before an actual audit. Uh, a mock audit also gives you a chance to um, establish uh, what your actual responses are going to be for the actual audit um, in cases where you think there might be questions uh, so that um, you're well prepared. Uh, and uh, of course, if there are cases of, of actual non-compliance, um, it gives you a chance to develop mitigation plans. Uh, and um, even if you can't implement those mitigation plans ahead of the audit, at least you have them in place and have a, a response that includes a, a mitigation plan, depending on your timing. Uh, a mock audit may seem like a, a, a large uh, project or large task, um, but it's worth noting that you can do this in pieces and parts. So if you have an idea of where you think you'll be challenged in terms of compliance or evidence, that's a good place to start uh, with uh, a mock audit internally. The other benefit of a, a mock audit process is that it allows uh, the groups involved to start uh, opening some of the communication channels ahead of time uh, so that you're not uh, meeting people for the first time uh, in an actual audit situation. You may actually have, have developed a relationship with them uh, ahead of time. Yeah, and Tim, I'll, uh, I'll throw something in there. On, on my experience working at NERC, I, uh, I used to, you know, go on a lot of audits and, and advisory sessions with the sufficiency review program, which was called the security reliability program at some point. So what we would do is go on site and just get the SIP compliance team at the entity together and talk through some of these issues. Um, pretty much every one of them that we came out of, it was stated that how helpful it was just to get everyone in the room at the same time. And in most cases, it was the first time that's ever happened in the history of the company. So um, a lot of the times we would see that in, you know, especially if it's a large utility, uh, you know, they have generation, control center, transmission, they're all kind of operating in a silo. And it's, sometimes it's been even within the transmission organization where different departments are also operating in a silo. And by bringing everyone together and putting everyone in the same room, you know, you're really striving towards that common goal, and it's to get through this audit, to get compliant, and make sure you identify any issues so you can correct them prior to having an auditor come on site. So I can't stress enough how important it is to do a mock advisory session, audit, review, whatever you want to call it, um, but do that now and make sure you know the places to look, the people to talk to, the responses in place. So when it comes time to the actual audit, you are well aware and prepped on everything that's coming down the pipe. 
And Nick, you make a good point that that if the the idea of something called a mock audit, um, you know, scares you or 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 is uh, a difficult thing to culturally to get done in your organization, don't call it that. <laughs> uh, you know, make it the same kind of task, but call it something else uh, that um, that's a little more palatable because. There's incremental benefit here uh, by conducting, uh, uh, you know, a partial mark mock audit around the areas you think will be uh, the most difficult. So, Nick, I'll turn it over to you for the, the second one. Sure. So, critical step number two is review your training education program. And really what we mean here is there's a lot of stuff that has to take place prior to July 1st. And if you have low impacts coming in April, um, it's a big not only uh, process and procedural change, but you also are impacting the culture of your organization. Uh, whether you have a version 3 program or not, um, that's kind of one type of entity that we looked at while I was at NERC, is, yeah, they have a little bit of an easier transition because they're used to doing this stuff already. Uh, you know, when you start to bring in low-impact sites, people that um, particularly haven't been operating or even know what the words SIP are, it's, uh, it sure is a culture shock, and I've seen it. Um, in person many times, and I'm sure everyone on the line has probably experienced this already when they're trying to introduce SIP to some of these new environments. So with that, highly recommend that you take a look at your R1 and R2 program and make sure where you can automate anything possible within that program, you do that. Because the more manual processes that take place inside of this uh, content creation, record keeping, and, and managing an overhead of notifications, um, the more you're going to run into challenges. And the reason I say that is 004R2 is a tough one to, um, to demonstrate compliance with because you have to show the auditors not only your PRA records for your personnel, you have to show what vendors were active at what time, you have to maintain those records for those that left the organization and vendors and contractors and staff that uh, particularly aren't in the program anymore and then show those lineup records of when they had access to the cyber assets and cyber systems. So they're going to be looking at all of this across the board, and it's very easy to slip and miss, you know, a couple records here and there, and, you know, someone kind of points the finger saying, well, that was, that was their group that was supposed to deal with that set of contractors. And, again, I go back to that point of we're all on the same team here. What the auditor is going to really look for is they're not as concerned when you miss, you know, one or two contractors here and there because, they were on vacation or whatever the cause may be, what they're looking at is the program. And the program should detail controls in place on if you missed a contractor or vendor, what are you doing to alleviate that issue from happening in the future? So kind of pulling back from that identify, assess, correct language, that's what compliance is built all around. And when you identify an issue such as missing a couple records or, or missing some type of documentation here, you want to be able to identify that assess what caused it, and then correct it so it doesn't happen in the future. So minus that language, the concept's still going to be there. Um, training and awareness is one of those that is, uh, you know, a high PV uh, history that I used to see out in the field because of that same scenario I just mentioned. So if you haven't taken a look at putting this program in place and putting it together um, by now, you really need to because what we recommend is whether you have a small or mid or large size entity, you need at least 30 days out to have this completed. So if you don't start by June 1st to get everyone up to speed completed with their training prior to July 1st, then uh, you're running a risk of running into some PDs in the future. All right. So for critical step number three, uh, if you've got some time, uh, we chose to uh, talk about automation. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, the, the phrase automate or die. Uh, an example I want to give here is uh, a metaphor, if you will, of cutting down a tree. So if um, if the compliance task is to, to cut down this tree, you can, of course, uh, do that with a, a nice handsaw. Uh, and, uh, you know, with some effort, you will actually cut that tree down. But you can also choose uh, to do that with uh, the, the latest in technology, uh, a tree harvester that will automatically cut and strip the tree while you uh, sit comfortably in that uh, that little uh, glass enclosed chair, uh, and this is really the difference between being compliant and being automated. Uh, there may be a number of cases in your preparation for SIP five and now SIP six where you've uh, established a process that uh, requires a fair amount of manual effort 
that allows you to achieve compliance, to demonstrate compliance, uh, but you may have an opportunity to automate uh, either some or all of that process in a way that will ultimately reduce the burden, uh, both from a, a compliance standpoint and from a, a cost standpoint for your organization. So you can uh, make yourself a, a little bit of the, the hero in the organization by taking the, the time, uh, that, uh, that found time that we have, and using it to move manual processes uh, to a, a more automated process. Uh, a, an approach to doing this would be to um, simply make a list of the uh, areas of, of NERC-SIP compliance that uh, require the, either from a process standpoint, require the most effort, uh, you find the most painful, or from an evidence generation standpoint, require the most effort. So you may have an automated process, uh, but the evidence generation uh, is a manual process. Making that list and then simply brainstorming or uh, uh, discussing ways in which those processes might be automated given time uh, allows you to start the the um, start down the path of, of automation. Uh, and if you're the type of organization that um, makes investments based on a you know a strong uh, ROI case, uh, you could actually develop a, a costing model of how much effort uh, how much cost you're spending for that manual effort versus a proposed automation and come up with a way that in this time that you've now found, you could actually save the organization money by implementing automated processes. So for critical step three, we think that uh, moving towards automation is a great way to use the found time that you may have uh, between the, the April and July or the April and future deadlines beyond that. So those are the, the three critical steps that we think uh, organizations can take between now and their, their upcoming deadlines, uh, working on a, a mock audit uh, reviewing your training programs, as Nick pointed out, and uh, identifying areas of, of manual effort that you can automate. So with that, uh, I'll give um, uh, hand it over to Nick for a minute to talk a little bit about curricula, and then I'll talk a little bit about Tripwire, and then we'll move on to the, the Q&A. Sure, and just to touch on that last slide where we talked about automate or die, that came straight out of the implementation study. So uh, it was kind of a quote that we phrased because every time we would run across kind of these low risk, high volume type issues like logging and monitoring and patching and, and so on, um, it is just overwhelmingly difficult to try to do this stuff manually. And there are plenty of solutions, options. You know, people have already invented the wheel here. There's no need to reinvent it. Um, talk with your fellow entities about how they're doing some of this stuff and what they've discovered and identified. Um, and Because that's what we saw and we experienced and worked with some of these entities early on uh, one of them just, that just kind of came to mind was uh, identifying patch sources. And it's just one of these ongoing issues that, you know, you've got to keep checking for, you know, a patch source to make sure it had available patches for you so you can keep them identified and make sure that they are available and, and so on and so on. So um, a lot of things that came out of that, but I think, you know, going back to that critical step one, during that mock audit process, you can not only identify some of your, uh, weakness areas, the, the areas that, you know, you have a little bit trouble demonstrating compliance to, but even if you do have an area that you identify that can be taken care of, um, look for ways to automate that because the more automation, the better, and, you know, without that, uh, you know, obviously automate or die, so you're in bad shape. But um, with that, I'll flick out over to our last uh, slide here. So just and for those of you... Quickly tell oh, go ahead. Uh well, while Nick and I talk for a second here, if you have questions, there is a Q&A link in the, the, the uh, interface there, so you can enter your questions. There are a couple in there now, uh, but uh, this is a good opportunity to enter questions as, um, as you listen to Nick and I. Yep, so curricula, like I said, I came from a seven-year background at NERC, um, specifically designed curricula and founded curricula to focus on NERC SIP compliance for entities. Uh, we basically automate and develop a program to take care of all of your R1 and R2 quarterly awareness and annual SIP year training requirements. With our quarterly delivery, basically every quarter you get a new episode. The way we teach our episodes is through story-based learning. So you kind of watch these characters go on adventures, and it kind of teaches you a little bit about cybersecurity, which gives you your vegetables, but also at the same time uh, candy coats the whole process. So it feels like you're not really going through a typical training. And with that, we also track analytics, and it's a very simple self-serve product for entities to push out quarterly awareness campaigns to all of their sites, regardless of location, 
Um, so it's a really, really uh, neat program that we bundled together. And then as far as our R2 product, we basically started from the ground up building on those nine objective statements, um, same style of teaching where we basically translate all of the very uh, fun legal language of what NERC SIP is down to a level where it's easy to understand and produce for your staff, contractors, vendors. Uh, we have that in both a hosted platform and a, uh, if you have your own learning platform on site, we can deliver that in, in uh, compliant format so it can integrate right into your current system. Um, so that is all set up kind of one, um, you know, one package for SIP compliance training. You can check all of that out at getcurricula.com or send me an email, nick at getcurricula.com. And right there you'll be able to sign up for a demo and one of us will reach out to you and um, show you kind of how it works and, and be able to work with your staff on getting you up and ready for July 1st. And for Tripwire, uh, Tripwire has been involved with NERC SIP uh, since the, the beginning of the standard, really. And uh, in 2013, we, we formalized our uh, NERC solution suite, uh, which uh, consists of uh, three products and a, a set of content. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise, which is really the flagship product uh, and performs uh, detection of changes in the environment and compares uh, existing configurations to baselines. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise is also where our uh, whitelist profiler extension lives, uh, which is uh, what uh, profiles open ports and services and provides uh, automated uh, detection and justification of the ports and services uh, in the environment. Tripwire Log Center is our log intelligence product. Uh, it obviously, uh, not surprisingly, fulfills the, the logging requirements and some of the security uh, incident response requirements within NERC SIP. Uh, identifying uh, events of, of interest and allowing uh, customers to respond to them. Tripwire IP360 uh, performs vulnerability assessment and uh, asset discovery. Uh, and of course, the, the Tripwire product suite uh, is integrated uh, with each other in a variety of ways that are, are beneficial to, to NERC SIP customers. Uh, and also with our uh, NERC Alliance network. So Curricula is a, a member of the NERC Alliance network, which is um, why we're, we're here working together. Uh, and there are other members that Tripwire integrates with as well to help uh, our NERC SIP uh, customers uh, achieve and, and maintain NERC SIP compliance. So with that, uh, we'll move forward uh, to the Q&A portion uh, and um, we'll pull up the, the question interface here and see what we've got. Um, I'll, um, I'll get started uh, with a question in there. Uh, and the question here is, what's the most common manual compliance process that you've seen automated? Okay, so uh, this refers back to the um, automator die uh, critical step, I assume. Uh, for Tripwire's uh, side of things, um, the most common uh, manual process that we see that, that customers choose to automate uh, is really around that ports and services requirement I was just talking about. So customers who are manually um, scanning for open ports and services and then manually creating a, maybe a spreadsheet with business justification, uh, that's a process that can be fairly painful uh, and take a long time. Uh, and we see a lot of customers use Tripwire products to, uh, specifically the whitelist profiler, to automate that process by pre-populating business justification and then mapping it to ports and services. Uh, and then also using that process to identify uh, exceptions uh, that need to either be uh, remediated or uh, for which justification needs to be added. So that's certainly the most common that we see. Um, Nick, you may have a, a different experience there since um, you obviously have a, a different perspective on the, the market as well. Yeah, no, I think that's all all. Uh, good and see. And, and kind of like what I said before is that the patch sourcing and patching and anything you can do on the side where there's a high volume of transactions, um, you know, you need to automate and look for solutions and products that can help in that. And uh, you know, I know Tripwire is one of them that, that can. All right. Let's see. Uh, another question here. Uh, I've got a question here for, uh, I'm, I'm new to SIP, uh, and what's the best way to learn about NERC SIP? Um, well, <laughs> I don't know. Nick, you, you may have some opinions about that, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll let you go first there. Sure. So it, it really depends on the group that you're working in, um, whether you're a very technical hands-on person or more management control. Um, Obviously, we, we kind of provide some of the education on the formal side of the objective statements, but if you want to learn a little bit deeper on that, um, I would highly recommend going to the SIPC meeting, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Committee meeting. Um, that's where a group of 
fellow utilities get together and talk about uh, all types of things going on in the utility industry related to cybersecurity. Um, but more on the SIP compliance side, I would recommend going to the NERC website and go under implementation study, I think, or no, transition program it's under, under the SIP group. And that has a ton of documentation on, uh, they call it a the NERC um, curriculum, I think. And under there it has uh, broken down by standards and groups. You can see presentations and other types of information that uh, would definitely be helpful to get you up to speed on, on where we are. And then beyond that, I would recommend talking with fellow utilities. You know, there's no better knowledge than kind of peer knowledge. And the more that you get involved and talk with other utilities that have been through it and experienced all of this, the, the better off you're going to be. And I'll, I'll echo that. Um, one of the ways that uh, is a, a great way to um, connect and interact with peers uh, are through some of the conferences that occur. I know both, um, you know, GridSecCon and, and EnergySec uh, both provide um, a good forum for interacting with your, your peers who, uh, you know, have a, a NERCSIP experience. Uh, the other uh, item I'll throw in there for, for that interaction, which is a, you know, a slightly different one, uh, if you have vendors, you know, like Tripwire, who are uh, who, with whom you're heavily invested, uh, asking them if they have any programs for uh, customers to interact with each other, or are willing to to host that kind of a program, or if you're willing to host that kind of a program sponsored by the vendor, you can often get a vendor who, um, you know, is willing to to um, to get customers together to talk about uh, SIP compliance, um, you know, not even specific to their product sometimes. So. Uh, there's an opportunity to to drive some of that um, in, in a little more intimate setting than some of the big conferences as well. Uh, I have another one here that came in. says, you mentioned having an awareness program for high, medium, and low impact facilities. When and how should we start on those? So that is um, a good question. So I kind of mentioned that they, they have different dates that apply to uh, high and mediums are applicable on July 1st of 2016, which is in less than 60 days. And your low impact sites are going to be on April 1st of 2017. So I'm not sure if I mentioned this during the webinar, but one of our recommendations that we're, we're pushing out to the industry is that you don't need to develop two separate awareness programs. You can combine the two to one holistic, you know, integrated awareness program and get started now. So you can bring some of those low impacts um, into play, and you can also have um, come next year in 2017, that culture that we talked about would kind of be already there because you've already introduced the concept of cybersecurity awareness at sites that haven't had to do cybersecurity awareness before. And by starting early, you can help get them situated into some of the other requirements and, and impact facility settings that they would need in the future. All right, we're headed towards the uh, the bottom of the questions here. So if you've been uh, hanging on to a question, feel free to, to get it entered now so that we can uh, make sure that we address it. Uh, the next question that I have here is uh, for uh, SIP 6 and SIP 7, what are the differences between the two uh, optional compliance dates? So that, that goes back to the, the compliance dates that I was uh, mentioning where there was a, a choice. Uh, and I do have that data handy. Let's see if I can find it. So for SIP 7, uh, 6, uh, R1.2, uh, the uh, compliance dates apply differently. Uh, so the compliance date for SIP 7, 6 requirement R1, part 1.2, that apply to PCAs and non-programmable communication components located inside a PSP and inside an ESP and associated with high and medium impact BES cyber systems is April 1st, 2017. Uh, so basically you get July 1st, 2016 for everything else. Uh, you can see why I didn't put this on the slide because it's a, a lot of language. Uh, and then the other one was uh, SIP 6, uh, which is about assets that you previously identified. And let me just scroll to the right part for it here. Uh, for So this is SIP 6 R1 part 1.10. For new high or medium impact BES cyber systems at control centers identified by SIP 2 uh, R5.1, uh, sorry, SIP 2-5.1, which were not identified as critical cyber assets in SIP version 3, the compliance date for this part is April 1st, 2017. So essentially for new higher medium uh, BES cyber systems that you didn't previously identify in SIP version 3, uh, you have a bit more time. And for those that were previously identified, it's July 1st. 
And if you didn't happen to write all of that down and you'd like to re-examine it in greater detail, those uh, details are included in the uh, implementation plan that NERC published January 23rd. Uh, and you can find it by searching the NERC site for uh, 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 implementation plan is probably the easiest way to do it. Or actually, uh, Google produces pretty good search results for uh, NERC SIP implementation plan as well. Uh, another one came in here. I, if I currently have a V3 program, what do I need to do to get training awareness compliant? Do I need to retrain my staff, contractor, vendors? Um, the short answer is yes on that. So um, version 5 coming in is a new set of standards. So the objectives and statements that were in version 3 are you know, different in version 5, as well as a lot of assets that are coming in the scope are different. So it's a new program. Um, as far as, you know, the dates, that all has to be done prior to July 1st, like I mentioned before. So um, starting July 1st, everyone has to have their training records completed by that date. And then as far as your awareness program, July 1st is the start of Q3. So that would say starting Q3, you need to have your ongoing awareness program from that moment up. Okay, I think that's it for the, the questions that have been submitted. Uh, and um, I would just like to say uh, thank you guys, uh, everyone, for spending time with us. Uh, hopefully it was uh, educational and, and maybe even a little entertaining. Uh, both Nick and I are um, happy to interact with folks outside of the, the webinar, of course. Uh, so I've put our uh, contact information back up there. If you have other questions or comments, um, feel free to um, – oh, it looks like – sorry, it looks like one more question came in. So I'm going to give – I think this one is Nick's. Uh, Nick, a chance to answer this before we, we move on for this uh, you know last-minute question. Okay. Uh, you made a reference that posters are insufficient for awareness training. Would a, a program of posters, articles, newsletters, emails also be considered compliant, or is it recommended to have more direct and interactive training such as webinars? So kind of what I mentioned is uh, all of the above. So. When you think of what a poster does, you know, just like we we're talking about culturally, you want to surround your staff with cybersecurity education. So a poster sitting kind of on the side in a dusty power plant is uh, probably not the best way for awareness to, to be pushed out, but um, you want to supplement that with other things like emails and newsletters and on-site meetings and webinars and whatever you can do to kind of get the, the, uh, the picture out there that you really care about this stuff because – when an auditor comes in, they're going to be looking at your awareness program. They're going to be looking at what you're doing for the entire organization. So, yeah, you have you might have some power plants and, and uh, control center and office workers and, and vendors all over the place. You need to get that program out to them and made available. So with that, you know, the, the amount of overhead that that could take, especially with some of these entities that are two, 300 different low-impact sites and facilities, um, it could be a big burden. So look for ways, again, to automate that and demonstrate that compliance and kind of tell your story of how you're, you know, improving the culture within your organization. All right. Thanks, Nick. So as I was saying, uh, both Nick and I are um, happy to, to have questions and interactions outside of the webinar. So I've uh, put our contact information back up there. Feel free to reach out to us uh, for a, a discussion or, or anything else NERCSIP related. Uh, and with that, again, I will thank you for spending the time with us and uh, hand it back over to, to Kate, I think, for a couple of last-minute uh, statements. Yes, thanks, Tim. Um, yes, thank you both of our presenters, Nick Santora of Curricula and Tim Erlin of Tripwire. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out an email with a link to the on-demand webcast and to the slides. Uh, if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast, you may respond to that email and let us know you'd like proof of attendance. We do hope to see you on future webcasts. Go to tripwire.com to find out what is coming up. And you can also check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security. Thank you, and have a great day.